Hi everyone, I wanted to talk about what I think is going on in Deltarune. Let's start at the beginning. When you start at Deltarune Chapter 1, you ask questions by a strange being. While a recognizable but unfamiliar song starts playing, that being another hymn. This uses Gaster's motif as a base, so it's pretty reasonable to assume this is Gaster, but let's just call him Vessel Master. Vessel Master shows you a soul, recognizable to us from our time playing Undertale, and tells us we must now create a vessel. Uh, we craft a body and a mind. We give this vessel a name. We give our name. We craft it in our own self-image. Or we don't. It's our choice. This vessel is the basis of my entire theory. This vessel is us. In Undertale, Frisk is very clearly not being controlled by us in the way Chris is. Frisk doesn't fight our control, Frisk shares our desires, our choices, our powers, and our responsibilities. We control Frisk because in Undertale, Frisk is our vessel. They're the interface we, the player, can use to interact with the world through control of our soul. This, a world, created by us, where the inciting incident was our self-insert falling through a hole. And now, we are in control of a vessel, taking the form of a human child. This soul belongs to Frisk, and we have been given control of Frisk's soul. In Deltarune, we have also been given control of a soul. This soul has been placed into Chris's body. But this is not Chris's soul. Chris is not our vessel. We are shown our vessel at the beginning of the game. We are given the choice to create this vessel in whatever manner we please. This is stripped from us out of nowhere by a voice that is meant to sound eerily familiar. It's a perversion of our own selves, first shown to us as an insertion with our own name in Undertale. You might have heard of the two voices theory. In both the English and Japanese versions of Deltarune, the voice that tells you that your vessel will be discarded is not the same one who aids you in creating it. Their capitalization is different, their text looks different, they use different scripts in the Japanese version. This is a different person. In fact, it's specifically the same voice that uh, Kara, or the fallen human, uses at the end of the No Mercy Road in Undertale, down to the same atypical use of kanji in the Japanese version. You might have heard that Deltarune is about choices and how they don't matter. This is not true. There is no choice that does not go unheard past the first chapter. Your vessel may be destroyed, but the name you gave to its creator was not. The Thrash Machine? Sure, it may have been a useless choice in Chapter 1, but you get to fight both against it and alongside it in Chapter 2, and what traits you gave it really do matter. Oh, and every single Darkner? Fight them, spare them, who cares? Fight ends all the same anyway. In Chapter 2, that's not true. You can recruit them by sparing them, or lose a separate by fighting them. You can even kill them in Chapter 2. There's an entire route dedicated to killing them. I mean, that's a massive choice, it literally kills Birdly. Obviously matters. At the end of Chapter 2, Noelle is told to do whatever she thinks is right. She is given that choice. But the second she wakes up, her choices stop mattering. Nothing matters anymore. Sure, it's little interactions that change, but no matter what you do, you'll end up in the living room, watching Chris create a dark fountain. Some being, a demon who appears when you call its name, maybe when you gave its name as creator of a vessel, they've stripped away any agency from the light world. They've thrown Chris into a situation where they can't do anything that matters. So when Chris finds out they can reject this premise through determination, notably a force that allows one to live without a soul, they do whatever they want. They eat a pie. They open up a fountain to the one place they can do whatever, even with the soul inside of them. The theme of control and puppetry falls into place here too. Through puppet strings do Stampton, literally, and Noel figuratively, become powerful. Through your control, does Frisk save the underground or leave it destroyed? Through the control of the soul, does Chris make a lifelong friendship with Susie? Chris doesn't project our soul, because when in the dark world, the choice is maybe that soul can do anything. Chris goes along with it because they need the freedom given to them by the loss of control. That leaves an important question. What is Chris's soul? I already explained this, but I think it bears repeating. Chris's soul, that's our vessel soul. It's like Frisk's soul, not literally, but like figuratively. A being with a different name, made for us, who either way acts as our interface to interact with the world through a soul. I believe that the Vessel Master was able to engineer an artificial soul, a device made in the shape of a human soul, which allowed an outsider to interact with their world through a vessel. Your own self, thrown into this world space-time, scattered across it, which now has its own life separate from your own. That's what Kara was in Undertale, a human meant to carry your own name who was meant to be a representative of you, who was given their own life, personality, body, and self through separation. In that sense, Kara is a self-insert who ceases to continue being one once they were born to the world of Undertale. I'm not insisting that Kara is not their own person. They are a person who may or may not have any name you choose, including their own, who you are asked to create when you reset the world of Undertale. The demon who comes when people call its name, the creator's name. Right after you name yourself as its creator, they appear. They have been given form in this world, because you threw their name into this world. They are a part of it now. But this time, you are Chris. So the soul you control in Deltarune is meant to be a vessels. It was meant to belong to your very own Frisk. You would come to the hometown, meet the residents, people who are very, very special, and watch as the events of the Dark World unfold. But someone didn't want you to sit by the sidelines, so they threw you into a familiar role. You are placed inside a human, whose brother is Azrael, their mother is Toriel, and their father is Asgore. They know that the first time they made a choice to enter this world, you threw them in that situation. 
This time, you get no choices. You don't get to interface with this world, so you're thrown into Chris. But, uh, the Great City Room. No, Chris isn't a monster. They can't absorb a human soul. Uh, maybe they can. But if they could, why not just reject it? Why pull it out, aimlessly shamble around, slashing tires, cutting pies, piercing open dark fountains? Why not just throw it away? I have my own soul, says Chris. I don't need this one. Nobody wants to be soulless. Flowey hated it. Spent all of Undertale plotting how he'd get his soul back. A plan, mind you, thrown into motion by your very own little demon. Chris, too, had a soul. And then they didn't. And now they do again. But it's not their own soul. It's someone else's. It's a vessel's. It's yours. Not literally yours in the same way Frisk isn't you, but the device, the soul, is your method of interacting with this world. Chris can't use it. They can live with it, but they can't control it. But they can control something. Their soul. Wherever it is, perhaps it's swapped places with the vessel and without a controller, Chris simply has no way to use their own soul outside of their own body. Perhaps Chris died, and their soul cracked into pieces, but they still had enough strength, enough determination, aimlessly shamble around like a zombie. Or maybe it was stolen from them by the demon, by a being who wants nothing more than to make their own choices. Instead of quietly letting their soul go into your very own vessel, they throw this vessel away, forcing the soul into Chris and stealing Chris's soul for themselves. We know they can steal souls, because after Frisk's soul is forever stolen, they have a nearly identical animation to soulless Chris in future True Passages Roots. I don't have an explanation for where Chris's real soul is. I have four explanations, but I don't know which one of them is true. I do have a favorite, though. Let's go over them one by one. The first one is simply that Chris is dead. Chris died, their soul shattered, but because of the power of determination, Chris's dead body simply continued living, like a zombie. Pretty much every case of Chris losing their soul involves a death in some sense, but this theory is specifically one of Chris's soul shattering, ending their soul's existence permanently. The new soul simply gives Chris the soul power needed to function properly. I don't like this one. It seems to be that Chris's personality of their soul is quite similar to their personality with their own soul. They're mischievous, act in strange or ridiculous manners, and sleep often. When we lose control of Chris, they frequently fall asleep or do something strange or silly. This happens very often. Any action not directly taken by the player is done by Chris, who can also take our commands and execute them as they please, not necessarily the way we want. This is shown through various means, usually through acts. For example, in Chapter 2, there's a dance act. We never tell Chris to do the specific humor or stance that they do. Nobody even suggests it. Later, we get the choice to tell Susie who we'd bring to a carnival. If you answer Rousey, Susie can tell that Chris didn't really mean it. Chris is clearly a lie behind the soul. Sure, you could consider Flowey to be a soulless zombie, but he was more spiritually tied to the flower he possessed rather than literally, physically. And besides, even if Chris has determination, as all Lightners do, they're not shown to have any more determination than anyone else. There's no real reason to believe that they're being revived through determination. I do think them being soulless has to do with determination, but I don't think Chris is literally dead, as in their soul is shattered and not simply missing, a distinction which is important to make. The second explanation is that Chris's soul is currently inside of a monster. In Undertale, monsters could absorb a human soul. Asriel did this in order to cross the barrier in Undertale, and later repeatedly does this in order to become Photoshop Flowey, or the God of Hyperdeath. I say it's a monster because I don't think humans can have more than one human soul, but you never know. In case it's a monster, there's a few possibilities for who can have this human soul. Uh, possibility 1. Asriel absorbing a human soul was an important motive in Undertale. It's what he did in the far past, you know, like 100 years ago. It's what he does repeatedly at the end of most routes in the game, and it's what ends up destroying the barrier in the end of the game, in a true passive history. But this does beg the question, did Asriel kill Chris and take their soul? Why would Asriel do this? Did Chris die in a horrible accident with Asriel, leaving Asriel with Chris's soul? Yeah, there's a lot of questions to answer there, aren't there? But the second possibility that I give is Des. Uh, we don't know anything about Des besides that she's Noelle's sister and that she's missing, most likely. And so is Chris's soul. There's not much past that. It's just two things missing together. They're in the same place, right? And of course, she'll probably be plot significant. And number three is Sans. I'm kidding. Um, number three is WD Gaster. He's the vessel master. I could see this being true, and it would be quite compelling, honestly. Okay, so let's move on to the third explanation of what's going on. The third explanation is kind of boring, it's just that Chris's soul is being held in an unmarked location, being held by the name Demon. They took Chris's soul to replace it with the vessels. Again, it's kind of boring, but it's a natural extension of the ideas that I've given so far. And number four is my favorite, but it's also probably not true. <laughs> um, and number four is essentially just, Chris's soul is Rousey, 
And I have a lot to say here, uh, so just <laughs> hang in there. I promise it will make some sense when I'm done. It's just like I mentioned in number three, Chris's soul is in some unmarked location. Why? I don't know. But either way, it's tied to their body in some way, isn't it? Maybe it is. I don't know. So because Chris's soul is tied to Chris, when Chris enters the Dark World, it manifests itself as Ralsei. It's why he's so quick to come over when he enters Chapter 2. It's why he even exists. This theory has no real evidence to support it. Ralsei is associated with the color green, which in Undertale stood for healing and kindness. Perhaps Chris's soul is green? But we have no reason to assume Chris would have any color soul. We could try to see what trade matches Chris best. Whatever it is, who's to say that soul colors line up with personality traits at all even? The six fallen children's souls were of a certain color, and they were the ones who had that personality. Perhaps Chris's soul is just green because that's who they are inside. There's no reason to assume their soul isn't green, even though there's no reason to assume that it is. So if Chris's soul is green, that could reasonably allow Ralsei to be a manifestation of Chris's soul. Honestly, even if it's red, it could, that red scarf, and the green could just be a manifestation of Ralsei's kindness. Why would Chris's soul, in an ideal world, manifest into a character who is so much like Asriel? So keep in mind that the dark worlds basically manifest objects into their essence. So why would Chris's soul manifest itself is Ralsei, someone who is so similar to Asriel. So Ralsei isn't actually as similar to Asriel than people think. Unlike Asriel, Ralsei is kind to a fault and overly affectionate. Asriel was shown to be gullible, and yes, very kind until he lost his mind, but he was never shown to literally be kind to a fault, and he was indeed capable of becoming extremely violent. Ralsei is like the perfect form of Asriel, concentrated down into pure love and kindness. Perhaps this is what Chris sees in Asriel? Perhaps it's what Chris desires to be like, and that makes Chris insecure, because unlike Asriel, they are distant and rude. They aren't kind even if they want to be. They hide behind their brother, who can navigate social situations, while Chris stands back, trying their best not to do something annoying or harmful. Chris hates this. Chris hates staring back at their insecurities. Chris wishes they were Rousey. This is basically the horns theory, but cranked up to another level. Chris's soul manifests what it believes is its purest form, Rousey, and Chris stares back at it with cold, cruel agony. The manifestation of their soul, the self they wish they could be, a mirror to their older brother, perfect second child, and Rousey. He loves Chris. He's absolutely obsessed with them. He's never really had a friend before, and now that he's made one, he never wants to let go. This is a representation of Chris's soul. Chris just wants some connection to anyone, and with Azrael gone off to college, they basically lost it. It's no wonder they open another dark fountain. Every time they go into one, they make new friends, save the world a little bit more, and make new interpersonal connections. But every single time they do that, they have to hope that you, who is in control, make the right decisions. Ralsei being a manifestation of Chris's soul to Darkner is a ridiculous theory, I know. If that's true, why don't any other Lightner souls manifest? Well, don't they? So, you spell December in Chapter 2, which is very clearly a manifestation of Noel's soul. The whole Dark World, the Cyber World, is so clearly made for both Noel and Birdly. It matches their souls perfectly. A cybernetic, ultra-intelligent world for Birdly, yet a cold, distant world for Noel, full of enemies based on illness. It perfectly matches what's going on in their souls. Chapter 1 is all about chaos, agency, and violence. Susie's soul is so clearly reflected all over Chapter 1, but uh, not as characters. Like, their souls are still inside of them. Um, when you throw a pe Halloween pencil into the Dark World, it becomes a spooky sword, not Spooky McPencil Man. So, just like how some things just become other objects, maybe in the same sense, souls, instead of manifesting as characters, manifest as traits for the dark world to hold. It doesn't literally create a character based on their soul, but it creates the world's character. But maybe Chris is different, because their soul isn't inside them, their soul is somewhere else. So maybe that could influence the dark world to manifest Ralsei as a darkener. Again, there's no proof of any of this. So if Chris's soul is Ralsei, where is Chris's soul? Why would it turn into Ralsei? Why would Ralsei have a dark fountain? Well, what if Chris's soul is underground, underneath the school? That's why when Chris jumps into the storage closet, out pops Ralsei. Chris's soul is down, down underground, in a laboratory, next to a discarded vessel. This essence seeps through the entire hometown's energies, allowing it to manifest anywhere, but its most powerful location is deep underground, in an abandoned laboratory hidden underneath the school storage closet. Ever notice how nobody ever goes in there? For a massive ubiquitous door. It's weird that nobody walks into the closet and discovers Ralsei's castle. It's probably just too dark in there. And the switch that causes the lab entrance to open simply is never pressed. The lab entrance is where the dark world is. The closet is just that, a closet. It's a dark closet holding immense power, but it's a closet nonetheless. That's the noise many and sons been hearing. 
It's a deep mechanical sound coming from an underground laboratory, which may or may not also house a dark world. The truth being, Ralsei's dark fountain is the only thing standing between Chris and their soul. I'm not the first person to insist that Ralsei is a manifestation of Chris. There's a common theory that Ralsei is the horns Chris wore as a child. I think this idea of Chris wearing goat horns isn't meant to literally mean the horns are Ralsei, but rather Chris's ideal self is one more like Asriel. This idea is stated alongside the idea that Chris's soul is Ralsei, culminates in the theme about choices, doesn't it? Chris can't choose who they are. No matter how much they want to be Asriel, there's something about Chris that makes them not Asriel. Hey, look at Ralsei. Ralsei isn't a perfect reflection of Asriel, he's a perfect reflection of how Chris sees Asriel. Him being a prince to his father's flower king, the golden child of the family, the one who everyone else likes. There's so much there in hometown that shows that Chris was always seen as second to Asriel. Chris, upon having their real soul replaced with a mechanical one meant for an artificial vessel, sees the real soul in the worlds they explore, manifests as a version of themselves they long to be but never will. It's no wonder Chris doesn't like Ralsei. Whereas Chris can long to be like Asriel, Chris can only resent Ralsei. Chris stares into Ralsei and sees a shattered dream of a broken hope, despair. And all the while, Chris's soul is chugging away in some machine, being hidden away by the demon you summoned in the place you summoned it. If you have any questions about my ideas, feel free to let me know. Do you think it's all wishful nonsense? Do you think Chris is the knight and Ralsei is a green crayon? Do you think Asriel is dead? Feel free to comment what he believes going on below and think about what I presented here today. If you've taken something from it in your analysis of Delta Rip as it stands after the release of Chapter 2, it would make me very glad. That's it for today. Goodbye.